we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Despite constitutional guarantees, Americans' civil rights and liberties are constantly in danger of violation, whether by individuals, corporations, or government institutions. Regardless of whether personal prejudices or national security concerns lie at the root of these violations, challenging them and holding wrongdoers accountable is imperative for the sake of the constitutional integrity and the preservation of the American way. Trial lawyers advocate for awareness, the truth, and a person's right to know. They believe that in the absence of the truth, all of us stand helpless to defend ourselves, our families, our health, and our way of life. Oftentimes, we don't think about or worry about or understand what is happening to another until it happens to us. Deceits have no boundaries. Disease doesn't recognize the color of our skin or our political party's affiliation. When it comes to cover-ups and false allegations by agencies of the state and the federal government, there is not a soul amongst us who does not have a cringing fear of their overwhelming awesome power. It is at these times that we need experienced and dedicated trial lawyers, the warriors in the courtroom, who are willing to battle for us tooth and nail in the halls of justice to protect our cherished way of life. Such a call for justice happened on the night of February 9th, 2007, when James LeBeau, a 43-year-old small engine mechanic, was viciously beaten by three police officers. The officers pulled him out of his home and severely beat him and then yanked him up by his neck to apply pepper spray. This excessive and unprovoked attack led to severe spinal injuries to James, which required major surgery to correct. The police officers claimed James had assaulted them first and they were merely acting in self-defense. Cases like these of everyday citizens versus the police often are decided on whose word does the jury believe. And juries typically trust police officers over ordinary citizens. But in this case, James had a good Samaritan looking out for him, a neighbor and an eyewitness who saw the entire savage police beating take place. Amanda Klug, a single mother who lived right across the street from James LeBeau. Amanda testified under oath that LeBeau just kind of poked his head out and this cop grabbed him by the shirt, threw him on the porch, and then he started screaming for the other cops to come. Then the other cops came running around the house onto the porch and they were, they started kicking him, and I saw one of them had one of those sticks or whatever it is, and he, I could hear James screaming, help, help, help. And then it went on for, you know, probably two or three minutes, them hitting him, and then they put him in handcuffs, put him in the car. The jury believed Amanda Klug over the three police officers. James LeBeau was awarded in 2010 a record $1.825 million for this vicious beating by these three police officers. Today, the insider exclusive investigative news team visits with James LeBeau and his lawyer, Vincent Lorelli, in this insider exclusive investigative network TV special, Police Brutality, James LeBeau's Story. To discuss the significance of this $1.8 million verdict against the police, because citizens have an absolute right to be critical of law enforcement and they can vocalize that criticism without any fear of being retaliated against. As Vince Lorelli has often said, the problem of police brutality is much more widespread than most Americans are willing to admit. 
Our nation practices a selective blindness. In this great and strong nation, we have all become unwitting accomplices to the continuation of the conflict. Vincent has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best civil rights trial lawyers in Michigan and across the nation. He has seen many innocent and hardworking people become victims of police brutality. He understands that police brutality is one of the most serious, enduring, and divisive human rights violations in the United States. The problem is not just in Michigan, but nationwide, and its nature is institutionalized. His goals, not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure all Americans have the right to a fair trial, honest cops, impartial prosecutors, and fair judges with no agendas. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Detroit, Michigan. It is my great pleasure to introduce Vince Lorelli to the show. Welcome to the show, Vince. Good morning. Tell our audience a little bit about your law firm. What type of law do you practice? Uh, good morning, Steve. We practice uh, personal injury in the state of Michigan. Uh, we do cases from auto negligence to police brutality, slip and falls. Okay. Um, we're here today talking about a rather landmark case, a police brutality case, excessive force. And would you tell our audience a little bit about, before the case, your client, James LeBeau? Well, Jimmy, as he's known, uh, ran into the Macomb County Sheriff's one night in February 2007. Yeah, he was a law-abiding citizen, right? And what made his case unique is that he was actually in his house. He didn't precipitate the contact with the police. Mm -hmm. Usually when you get these excessive force cases in, your client did something to initiate police contact. But Jimmy's case was unique in that he was just home on a Friday night minding his own business. Yeah, didn't they come to the wrong place? They did. They, they through the court proceedings, they admitted that yeah. they were at the wrong address yeah. when they initiated the contact with my client. Now, they came to his house. It was at nighttime, right? And About knocked midnight. on the door, correct? Correct. And then what happened? Well, that's where the versions differ. Uh, my client relayed to me that uh, he didn't know who was at the door. They did not identify themselves at police, as police officers. They were plain, plain clothes? No, they were in uniform, okay. but uh, there was no identification uh, right. such as a knock and then say, we are with the Macomb County Sheriff's Department. Rather, it was just a, a knock on the door, mm -hmm. uh, which caused my client then to stick his head out the door to see who was there because they weren't actually in the frame of the door. And then as soon as they, as soon as uh, Mr. LeBeau stuck his head out, that's when the officer pulled him out and then proceeded to, to beat on Mr. LeBeau. Just started beating him. Correct. There were, there were three of them, right? In total, there were three of them. You know, what happened as a result of this beating? Well, Mr. LeBeau suffered very serious injuries, yes. which required a uh, cervical or neck operation that took seven hours to perform. Now, he is also suffering from the equivalent of like post-traumatic stress disorder, right? As you can imagine, if you're yeah. at home alone and you have this happen to you, you're going to suffer tr uh, emotional injuries. Yeah. Then they arrested him and took him to jail, correct? They uh, arrested him, but they let him go. Okay. Uh, there was thought about pressing charges against Mr. LeBeau, but that never happened because he wasn't doing anything wrong. Right. When he first came, when Jimmy first came to you, and said, hey, I have a lot of medical problems as a result of the police beating on me. What went through your mind initially about taking this case? Well, Steve, I knew it was going to be a difficult case because you got to remember, this is, in, this is before the advent of home security cameras and cell phones everywhere right. uh, that can record these types of incidents. So mm -hmm. I knew that if this case boiled down to three police officers saying that Mr. LeBeau provoked them, versus Jimmy saying that he was dragged out of his home and beaten, I was going to lose this case. Mm -hmm. That a jury simply would not believe 
Mr. LeBeau over three veteran police officers. Right, but soon you discovered that he had a good Samaritan on his side. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yes. How, how, did, how did that come about? What happened and is... And who was it, by the way? As soon as my office got his case in, we realized the difficulty. So we canvassed the neighborhood to right. see if there was any witnesses. And luckily there was one, and only one, Amanda Klug, who happened to live kitty corner to, to Jimmy. Right. And she was a single mom, two kids, right? Right. She had just finished putting the kids to sleep mm -hmm. and happened to look out her, her window. And she saw the, the patrol cars there and was wondering what was going on. Yeah. And then she saw the whole incident. And yeah. for us, thankfully, she told the truth and it confirmed everything that Mr. LeBeau had said. Yeah, now initially she gave you a written deposition, is that correct, or a statement? That's correct, she gave okay. an affidavit to what she saw. And like any other citizen, she then rethought what are the possibilities of speaking out against the police, correct? That's correct, she was very hesitant to come to court. Yeah, she was timid. She was. Yeah, but how were you able to convince her to come to court. Well, it's not so much that I convinced her. <laughs> the court did. The, the court did. They through, subpoenaed her. Uh, they arrested her. They arrested her. They actually arrested her, and, okay. and it was a, a long process. We, was it as a material witness? Correct, okay. correct. We had set her deposition. She failed to appear. Yeah. Obviously, she didn't want to get involved because had, if these officers had done that to Jimmy, she was afraid that they would do it to her right. just as well. Um, after that, I was forced. I had no choice but to ask Judge Cohn for a bench warrant yeah. for her failure to appear. And um, about three weeks, I believe three weeks after Judge Cohn yeah. issued the bench warrant, the marshals picked her up and brought her to the courthouse for a deposition. Yeah. Now, in cases like this, excessive police force, what are some of the issues you have to prove? Well, the, the bottom line issue, Steve, is that you have to prove that the police officers acted unreasonably yes and and that's the the definition by which all the lawyers go right and it really turns on on these type of cases on whether the police used excessive force mm -hmm. because if a fact finder finds that excessive force was used that means that the police did not act reasonably yeah and the proof of the pudding is in medical reports right Correct. Okay. What what were the extent of his injuries? He had four very bad disc herniations in his neck. Okay. And uh, the worst thing about it is that they were at separate levels. So he had two disc herniations at at one part of his cervical spine. Yeah. He had a, a, a middle port portion that was all right, and then he had a lower portion that was also herniated. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is he needed a major operation yeah. in which uh, four discs were removed and metal and hardware were inserted in place of the disc to stabilize yes. the spine. Now, at the end of the trial, tried in front of a jury, right? Arbitration. Arbitration, rather. The result was what? We, we obtained a $1.825 million verdict from okay. Mr. LeBeau. And how did you go from uh, filing a lawsuit to arbitration? What happened was is that this case was litigated for an extensive period of time. Yeah. And the, myself and the defense counsel right. had talked about arbitrating it. And then uh, after Amanda Klug's deposition was taken, yeah. then both sides agreed that that would be a quicker that was a smoking gun. That was. And yeah. At that point, it, it, they knew that they were on the hook. Well, thank God she was there. You True. Know, she was the good Samaritan, the good neighbor, et cetera. Correct. Um, today we have your client, Jimmy LeBeau, so let's bring him on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jimmy LeBeau to the show. Welcome to the show, Jimmy. Thank you. Take our audience back to the time when the cops were rapping on the door late at night one night, and what happened next? Um, I was sitting at home filing warranty claims uh, for my work, and uh, about midnight came. A bunch of rapping was happening at the door. They were, they, the they door. were like animals. Yeah. Okay. It terrified me to death. And I ran from one window to another trying to figure out who was out there. We determined it was the police. Mm -hmm. And speaking to him, 
through the door. I said, you know, what are you guys doing? You're scaring the daylights out of me. And through the door, they had told me that somebody had hit my vehicle. Which was a lie. Which was a lie. Yeah. And they wanted me to sign some papers. <laughs> At midnight? <Okay. laughs> At midnight. Okay. Because somebody hit my vehicle. Right. Um, I opened the door. I started speaking to them. They didn't have anything for me to sign. I said, you know, if you guys got something for me to sign, I'll sign it, you know. Yeah. And the officer got mad at me, grabbed onto my shirt, ripped yeah. me out of the house. And pulled you out of the door. Pulled me out of my house and yeah. proceeded to kick the shit out of me. Just hit uh, you and kick you. Yeah, they were going to throw me on. They had me picked up. They were going to throw me on uh, my garbage that was sitting out on the porch, and they had shards of glass in it. I right. started screaming, no, not on the garbage. There's grass. Yeah. There's shards of glass in there. Right. So they ended up getting me on the porch, hog tying me, had me cuffed behind my back. I had one officer on the, my back while the other one was kicking me in the head and in the back and yeah, telling we, me to shut up. What were you saying? Were you saying? I was screaming for help. Yeah. I was at the top of my lungs. I was screaming for help. Now, you've never, you haven't had too many, if any, encounters with the cops, right? No, Never. no, I'm, 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 I'm law clean. abiding citizen. I did have some problems with these officers earlier that same day. No, no months earlier, months years earlier. earlier. Okay. Same okay. guys, same guys. Wait, is that because they came to your house by mistake? Prior or yeah, prior, this? prior. No, no, no. Okay. They so they remembered you. I believe, yeah, they, yeah, yes, they most definitely remember. So they hog tie you. They, they thought got you. I was on probation. Uh, they I hog wasn't. tie you and they got you down on the ground. Yeah. What happens next? Uh, I'm screaming for help. They're kicking me in the head, telling me to shut up. Yeah. And then uh, I wouldn't shut up. I kept asking them what it's all about, screaming for help. Yeah. And uh, they had an idea to shut me up. And I had one officer on my back while I was hog tied. And the other officer came around, Weislick, okay, mm -hmm. is the guy. He came around in front of me, grabbed me by my chin and the back of my head and snapped it around while the other guy was pumping down on my back. And it just, it, it, it was like a huge explosion. Yeah. Just a huge explosion. My whole body started quivering and whatnot. They pepper sprayed both my eyes, my nose and my mouth. And you, but you're hog tied. Up. You're I'm no, you're no threat tied. to them. Yes. You're no threat to them. No, not at all. I'm hog tied. But I was yelling for help Did, from the police. Yeah, now you are in a lot of pain at this. Oh state. my God! Yes. What did it feel like? Uh, a huge explosion. My whole body started quivering. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, I was done. I, I mean, I couldn't even scream anymore. Yeah. What happened next? Um. The third officer was in the house. He come running out of the house, said, there's nothing in here. There's nothing in here. And Officer Weislick was saying, there's got to be something in there. You've got to find something. Here, you stay here. I'll go look. So he took off, and then he came back out with an old can that was turned into a marijuana pipe. Mm -hmm. And he said, we got you now, James. We got you now. You blew your probation. You blew your 7411. All the old charges are coming against you, and we got new charges for you. Mm -hmm. And as they were carrying me off to the car, because I couldn't even walk at this point, I had pepper spray all over my face. I can't hardly breathe. I'm trying to choke out. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not on probation. I'm not on probation. And I got dad out and he said, what? I said, I'm not on probation. Mm -hmm. And he said, hold on. And then they put me in the car and in the car, about 45 minutes went by. And then at that point in time, somebody else pulled up, which I assume was Sergeant Willis, I believe it was Willis. And I hear voices in the background going, you fucking assholes, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Haven't we been through this shit before? You guys got to be solid on this stuff before you pull stunts like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, all right, good, you know. Uh, and then 
somebody came up to me in the car and said, Mr. LeBeau, we're sorry about this. This is all a mistake, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. One blah, of the blah. cops said this. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I assume it yeah. was Officer Weisley mm -hmm. or uh, Willis. So at that point, they took me back in the house. They walked you back in the house or carried they you back? They picked me up and took me back You're in the house. You're still hogtied. Right. Okay. Oh, I was cuffed. Cuffed now. Okay, they got me back in the house. Yeah. They said, we'd like to explain this to you. It's all a mistake. Right. We were looking for somebody else, and I'm going, bullshit, bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they wiped out my eyes and, you know, cleaned up my face. But you're still in pain. Oh, okay. man, I was telling them I need an ambulance. Yeah. Okay. And they told me I could not have an ambulance. Why? <laughs> I can't Why? have an ambulance. Why? Because I can't. That's just it. I can't have an ambulance. Yeah. All right? So... I tried to make my way over to my phone. I said, fine, I'll call my own ambulance. Yeah. And I tried to make my way over the phone to call my own ambulance. They unplugged the phone on me. What? And I'm like here by myself in my house, yeah. my own house. Yeah. All right? Well, what can I do? I can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. All right? They said, you want to go to the hospital? We'll take you to the hospital. I said, oh, bullshit. I'm not going nowhere with you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you guys will drop me off in a ditch, mm -hmm. and Jimmy LeBeau will just be found, and nobody will ever know what's happened, you know? No, I'm not going to the hospital with you guys. I want an ambulance. Well, you can't have that. Mm -hmm. I said, look, are you guys going to charge me with something? If you're not going to charge me with something, you get the fuck out of my house mm -hmm. right now. You get the fuck out. And they're like, okay, Jimmy, okay, but... I don't want to see this appearing on my desk tomorrow. I don't want to hear from you tomorrow. You got to give me your word. You're not going to, I'm not going to hear Make from a you complaint. tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I said, I give you my word. You will not hear from me. <laughs> You're from my lawyer. <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they got out of your house. And they got out of my house. So then you called an ambulance. I called my boss who was out doing some, he does uh, Elvis Presley impressions. Okay. And I knew he was out working, and he knew I was having problems with these officers before. Right. And I called him up and I said, Mark, you know, uh, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. Yeah. And I said, the cops are just here. They just kicked the shit out of me. They snapped my neck. I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. So He's he like, brought you to the hospital? Well, no. He was like, just mellow out, Jimmy, mellow out. You're still breathing and everything, right, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he just figured I was shook up. Yeah. And the following morning, I got up and, and I was in so much pain. Well, how did you sleep if you're in a lot didn't. of pain? I didn't. So then, did, how did you end up at the hospital? When did you I go? I picked myself up. I got myself to the car and I got myself to the right. hospital. To my, uh, what... Um, when is it called? It used to be Mount Clemens General. McLaren. Yeah. McLaren now, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I wobbled into the hospital. Yeah. And I'm telling them the cops kicked the shit out of yeah, me. Yeah. And they're going, no, no, no. They didn't even want to give me an x ray or anything. I'm telling them, look, guys. And nobody wanted to believe me. They gave me some Tylenol 3. And they said, how'd you get here? I said, I got myself here. They said, well, you can get yourself home. Well, this is a medical malpractice situation. Okay. So you left? And well, I was, they weren't going to do nothing. Yeah. I couldn't even, they, they weren't doing nothing. So how me. did you end up getting medical help? So home? I'm home. That afternoon, this guy, gentleman, calls me on the phone. His name's George Brico. And the telephone rings, and I'm laying there because I couldn't make it into work. And I'm all shook up, too. And uh, the phone's right next to me, and I pick it up thinking it's my boss checking up on me and whatnot. Yeah. And I get this phone call, and this guy picks up on the phone, and he goes, Hi, Jimmy. My name's George Brico. You don't know me, but your boss told me everything that's happened to you and the problems you're having with these police. Right. You're not going to take this, are you? Tell me you're not going to take this. Tell me you called a lawyer. And I said, yeah, George, I've got to call out to about four attorneys, yeah. but nobody's calling me back. Right. You know, Figer and all that. You see him on yeah. TV. I yeah. had calls into them all. Nobody's calling me back. Mm -hmm. 
And he goes, have you been to the hospital? I said, well, I tried, but they don't want to do nothing for me. He goes, Jimmy, I'm going to come over there and pick you up, take you to the hospital. Okay. And by God, this man out of the blue and the goodness of his heart did. Yeah. And what, what, is, what was his capacity? What was just a good friend or a friend of his know. boss? He's a friend of his boss. That's yeah, it. He Just worked a at a party store. So he brought you to the hospital. He picked me up, took me to yeah. Boma, yeah. where they at least took x-rays and stuff. And they found out how serious they, it was. And he could see it. I had problems. Yeah. Wow. In the meantime, he got on the phone to Vince, and Vince was going, okay, I'll listen to it. Yeah. And I and spoke then, to Vince. Yeah. I don't think Vince exactly believed me off the get-go. He was right. like... You know, Jimmy, something doesn't sound right here. This just doesn't sound right. Cops just don't come into people's right. homes, beat them up, and then leave. And I'm going, Vince, I'm telling you. I'm telling you this yeah. is what happened. So today, how are you medically today? I'm nowhere near the man I used to be. Okay. I used to be very fit, very go-getting, yeah. on the ball. Um, now You still I'm, have pain? Oh, all the time. What do you take for it? Um, I milk through it I try not to take nothing I okay. normally load up on a bunch of ibuprofen and yeah. stuff but it's been giving me some lung problems filling up so now I snuggle up to my dog yeah and I spend the majority of my time lying down yeah really I mean for, for years so when I stay cooped up in my house yeah I don't go out of my house right okay I don't like driving down the street Every time I get around an officer, I become a wreck. Right. I don't like really reliving this like I'm doing right now. Right, and we appreciate you sharing okay. this with the audience. I really don't like it. Because what do you, what do you have to say to the audience this right now? This stuff's gotta stop. Right, what do you to have to say to, to the audience if they've experienced something similar? What do you have to say? Oh, you have to stand up to it. But my opinion is you're not safe in America anymore to yeah. live single in your own home. You have to live under a camera. Yeah. You have to live with somebody yeah. just to be safe from the police. Right. Because the police can and will come in your home anytime they want, do what they want, and then make up the story to fit whatever needs they want. Right. And unless you can prove otherwise, mm -hmm. you're hit. Right. One last question. Vince represented you in this case. Yes, sir. Landmark settlement. What would you say to others who have experienced the same problems with the police about the way Vince handled your case? Oh, Vince did a great job, okay? I mean, we told him. He didn't necessarily believe me at first. He investigated it. Mm -hmm. We started getting things started coming in, and he started going, things aren't right here. I got to dig into this further. And I mean, you've seen the case, it's this yeah, thick. Right. He did his homework, he did a good job, he stood by me all the way. He started making sure I got medical attention. Yes. Okay, um, you know, I wish the medical attention could have come quicker, okay? But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. You gotta stand your ground, you gotta stand up to the police. This yeah. isn't a black thing. It's not a white thing. You yeah. see all the racial tensions it's abuse of in power. America. Abuse of power. It's cops with swollen heads that yeah. think they are the law, yeah. the judge, and the jury. Right. And as long as they're not held accountable, they can do whatever they want. Okay. This is where I want cameras on all officers. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a lot of lying officers out there. Right. Well. I want to. Th I know how much this meant to you to come here, and we certainly appreciate it because, you know, we've seen many cases like this. And if there's other people out there, you know, we want to know who the good lawyers are, the ones that can handle these cases, can really investigate them. And thank you very much for sharing. Appreciate. I'm it. glad to be here. Not glad to be here, but glad to do my part. And thank something you. really needs to be done. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Vince, a lot of people claim that they're harassed or beaten by the police. Um, how do you determine whether what they're saying is true and the extent of their damages? Not everybody like Jimmy has these you know, huge medical bills. How do you determine that? Well, Steve. Because you, you handle a lot of these civil rights cases. We do. 
when when Jimmy's case came to us, that was before the advent of cameras everywhere. Right. Uh, cameras in the police cars, cameras on cell phones, mm -hmm. cameras in people's houses. So nowadays it's easier because we're finding that there is a video uh, track or a video evidence of what actually transpired. Mm -hmm. Back when this case occurred, though, there was no such thing. So what was really important is just to, one, find witnesses that, that confirm your client's story, and then two, try to poke as many holes in the officer's story as possible, mm -hmm. because they're always going to present an opposing point of view. And, and you have to go through each case and you have to pinpoint the inaccuracies in the officer's story so that your client is believed. Well, don't they all like get together and share what story they're going to tell? They don't remember it all? That's true, Stephen. In, in our business, you find that uh, the people that tell the truth yeah. are often, their stories are a little bit off because two people never remember the same event exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with police, you're exactly right. The story is always the same. Yeah, whenever we do these stories, and we've done a lot of 1983 civil rights cases, I always like to point out to the audience that the majority of police are good people. That's correct. I mean, thank God we've got law enforcement to protect us. But there's a small percentage, I don't know what that percentage is, one, two, five percent or something like that, that are bad cops, shouldn't be cops. Correct. What annoys me the most with some of these cases is the police departments and their lawyers try to cover up cases like this because they don't want to pay out the, you know, the big bucks, right? They don't, want, they don't want negative press on some of their officers, which they should have disciplined before, okay? Why do you think that there are, why do you think cops, some cops, very small percentage, why do you think some cops are bad cops? Well, I mean, there's an, uh, a multitude of reasons, I think. Yeah. Some individuals get into uh, the police for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Others, as you said, shouldn't be police officers in the first place. Yeah. And I think because of that, uh, you have these issues with these few police officers. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad because, like you said, the overwhelming majority of police officers are fine individuals yeah. that do a hard job. Yeah, thank God we have them. Correct. Um, do you think the police can police themselves? No. You know. And I, I saw that in the Jimmy LeBeau case yeah. because there was issues with some of the officers who had been disciplined before, before. Uh, but the discipline was actually lessened at the insistence of the defendant's superior officer. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think so. Yeah. Do you think, I see today, you know, we're, we've been around police for a long period of time. I see the mentality of police today, a lot of police departments, as them against us. It's no longer, you know, the community involvement. You don't see that too much, do you? No. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, what else can you advise someone who thinks that they have been harassed, uh, police use excessive force against them? What do you advise clients to do, potential the clients? The most important thing is to seek legal counsel right away. Yes. And the reason why I say that is because it's most important to develop the case at the beginning. Yeah. People move, their memories fade, yeah. and it's very important to develop the factual basis to support your client's view yes. and to negate the police officer's yeah. view. You brought up the fact that this was before the wide use of cell phones, dash cameras, stuff like that, right? Correct. We see time and time again where somebody, let's say, is stopped by the police, maybe somebody else is in the car or even the driver that they're stopped, you know, they start using their cell phone. They say this is going to be recorded. Can they do that? Can a citizen do that? Yes. They course, can. Yes. But oftentimes the police will say, give me that camera. That's true. Do they have the right to take it? They don't have, unless there's probable cause for a seizure yeah. of that cell phone, they do not have Because I've seen that time and time again where cops try to confiscate Correct. all the, you know, video documentation that might prove what, the, what your future client might be saying, right? Correct, but it would be an un unreasonable seizure at that point. What do you recommend with anybody when, they encounter, when they're stopped by the police? They should conduct themselves civilly, right? Correct. Don't, don't make the cop angry? Exactly. Because you never know who you're dealing with. That's true. Yeah. You know, the best thing to do is act polite, answer the questions, yeah. and hopefully move on. You have a lot of people contact your office that to represent them primarily. You know, I know you have personality, but in civil rights cases, how do you select the clients that you do? Well, that that's a uh, there's a, a number of different factors that we use. Yeah. 
uh, most of it have to have to do with the alleged facts of the case. Yes. And like I said at the, at the onset, is most of these cases, the individual comes to us precipitating the contact with the police. Right. So you got to look at that because the jury is going to be confronted with those facts. And if those facts are negative to the client, it's mm -hmm. going to carry through in the litigation, yeah. which makes the case that much tougher. Yeah. So y you think twice about those types of cases. With the LeBeau case, is the exact opposite in mm -hmm. that he had absolutely nothing to do that precipitated the police contact. Yeah. So that's that's one of the factors that we we you know look at. Yeah. The other factor would be what type of presentation does the client make? Is he believable? Yeah. Because again, a lot of these cases boil down to he said, she said, and yeah. and you want a presentable client that the jury's going to feel for and believe. Right. I want to thank you very much for being on the show and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.